the, another installment in the SMFM Fellow Lecture Series. Um, today we're back to our third lecture series. Um, and I'm very proud to um, have uh, Dr. Amina Kandawal from Cooper University Healthcare uh, discuss today renal disease and pregnancy, something that we all uh, obviously see very frequently. Just as a reminder, our next lecture is the uh, day before Thanksgiving um, on our research series. Um, and so I hope everybody will tune in for a great lecture on databases. Dr. Kandawal, I'd like to um, now turn the lecture over to you, and you can proceed ahead. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Bill. I'd like to thank Pedro Lyle, Vince Brugiella, and Bill Goodnight for giving me this opportunity to talk to you and discuss renal disease and pregnancy. We're going to discuss this in two parts, part one now and part two um, in the spring. Um, just want to let you know I have no conflicts of interest. Um, today we're going to discuss the pathophysiology, um, infections in renal disease, and chronic kidney disease. When we discuss any medical condition in pregnancy, we always want to discuss it what the effect of the pregnancy will be on the disease and what the effect of the disease will be on the pregnancy. And I also would like to introduce these initiatives to you, some of which you may or may not be aware of. One is the KDOKI and the other is the KDECO. The KDOKI is the Kidney Disease Outcome Quality Initiative put forth by the National Kidney Foundation. And in 2002, they came up with a new staging system which has revolutionized um, the practice of nephrology. Uh, they also uh, prefer to use the term kidney because it's understood by everyone, including the patients. The KDECO is an international organization um, for improving global outcomes, and they endorsed the staging system in 2004, and then they modified the staging system after a controversy conference in 2009. So we'll discuss all of that. Um, So before we um, know what's a deviation from normal, we need to know what is normal. So let's discuss a little bit about the pathophysiology of um, renal disease in pregnancy. The most important physiological change in pregnancy is renal vasodilatation, and this results in increased renal plasma flow. By just three to four weeks post-conception, the renal plasma flow in a pregnant woman is um, 30% above pre-pregnancy levels, and by 16 weeks, it peaks to 80% above pre-pregnancy levels. This results in increased GFR and renal hyperfiltration. The effect of this is an increase in creatinine clearance from about 100 to 150 mLs per minute. In the third trimester, back to 36 weeks, the large gravid uterus compresses the intra-abdominal vessels and results in a 20% decrease in GFR. This is normal, and this should not be taken as a reduction um, in, in renal function. As a result of renal hyperfiltration, there is also a decrease in serum creatinine in pregnancy. And so while in the non-pregnant female, a serum creatinine of 1.1 or greater is considered abnormal, in pregnancy, a serum creatinine of 0.9 or greater is considered abnormal. As a result of the increased um, renal hyperfiltration, there's increase in urinary output and frequency. There's also increase in proteinuria. Now, normally, in a non-pregnant patient, less than 40 milligrams in 24 hours is, is considered normal. However, even to allow for variation and dietary intake, up to about 150 milligrams is also considered normal. However, in pregnancy, um, up to about 300 milligrams of protein excretion in 24 hours um, is normal. And only when it reaches above 300, we consider it abnormal. Proteinuria also predicts worsening renal dysfunction. However, because of the increased GFR in pregnancy, 30% of women with chronic kidney disease without proteinuria will develop significant proteinuria in pregnancy. And that doesn't necessarily mean their renal function is worsening. Also, some women with 
chronic kidney disease and proteinuria may develop nephrotic range proteinuria in pregnancy. The other key change in pregnancy that occurs is that despite the renal hyperperfusion, there is no change in the glomerular capillary pressure because of autoregulation. This is very unlike seen in renal pathological conditions in which a renal hyperperfusion leads to glomerular hypertension or increase in glomerular capillary pressure. Also, if this, this compensatory renal hyperperfusion is not seen in pregnancy, this usually suggests renal deterioration in pregnancy because the pathology has already caused maximum renal, renal vasodilatation and no further renal, renal vasodilatation can occur um, because of the pregnancy physiology. The, um, here's a graph showing rise in renal blood flow does not raise the renal arterial pressure. However, if there's impaired autoregulation, the renal um, glomerular pressure will rise. The autoregulation primarily occurs because of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. This consists of the stretch receptors in the afferent arteriole, the renin angiotensin system, as well as the tubular glomerular feedback in the distal tubule. The chloride ions, if they increase because of hyperfiltration, is sensed by the distal tubule and will result in renin secretion and constriction of the afferent arterial here. So just to go over this briefly, when there's increase in arterial resistance, there's increased pressure before the resistance and decreased pressure after. Just similar to a traffic jam. When there's a traffic jam, there's a traffic jam before the, the accident. However, the traffic is relatively free moving beyond the accident. So this is the same thing. So if an efferent arterial constriction occurs, there, is hyper, there may be hypertension before. However, the glomerulus is protected from the hypertension. The vasoconstriction occurring in one nephron may also be transmitted back up the artery and lead to vasoconstriction in adjacent nephrons, just like a traffic jam can result in traffic jam in the tributaries. In pregnancy, there is vasodilatation in the afferent as well as the efferent arterioles, and so there is no net change in the glomerular capillary pressure. However, in pregnancy-induced hypertension, there is vasoconstriction in the afferent arteriole to protect the glomerulus from the high blood pressures. In cases of hypovolemia, the vasoconstriction occurs in the afferent arteriole in the efferent arterial, I'm sorry, to protect and maintain the glomerular filtration pressure, which is dropping from the hypovolemia. The other physiologic change that occurs is in the renal tubules, where there is decreased glucose reabsorption and results in glycosuria in 70% of healthy women. There is also a threefold increase in urinary calcium and to maintain normal plasma levels, the placenta produced in, produces increased vi vitamin D levels. There is also pelvic pelvial dilatation in pregnancy, and this starts as early as six weeks and peaks at around 20 to 22 weeks. As a result of all these changes, there is increased risk of urinary tract infections in pregnancy from the short female urethra, urinary stasis, vesicle urethral reflux, glycosuria encourages bacterial growth, and the hormonal changes and changes in urinary pH and osmolarity decrease the ability of the urothelium to repel bacterial attachments. And therefore, asymptomatic bacteria in pregnancy gains a lot of importance. Asymptomatic bacteria is defined as greater than 10 to the power 5 colony forming units per ml of urine, in a first void clean catch specimen in a patient with no urinary symptoms. If the specimen is not a first void, even those lesser quantities of bacteria may be significant. The incidence of asymptomatic bacteria is not any different in pregnancy from the non-pregnant state. However, it is really important and, and, we, and routine screening is recommended 
because a third of when pregnant women with asymptomatic bacteria will develop acute pyelonephritis, whereas only less than 1% in the non-pregnant state will develop pyelonephritis. Women who do not have asymptomatic bacteria, only 1.8% of them will develop pyelonephritis, and if we treat the asymptomatic bacteria, less than 1% will develop pyelonephritis. There are two papers suggesting cost-benefit analysis based purely on decision analyses, um, suggesting a significant benefit to screening. However, there are no prospective randomized trials in this respect. In a Cochrane review by Small in 2007, there was a 75% reduction in the incidence of pyelonephritis when asymptomatic bacteria was treated, and there was a decrease in low birth weight birth weight with treatment. There is a prospective randomized trial uh, planned in the Netherlands, and the protocol of this has been published in the British Journal this year. To diagnose a lower urinary tract infection, the gold standard is a urine culture. In asymptomatic patients, dipsticks miss half of these patients, and so dipsticks are not reliable for screening. In symptomatic patients, dipsticks are specific enough to warrant empiric treatment, however, urine culture is still recommended. In patients who have persistent symptoms despite treatment and no uropathogen is isolated, we should consider other um, organisms like trick, herpes, chlamydia, or even interstitial nephritis. Usually, patients who do not have asymptomatic bacteria at the first screening do not require re-screening because studies have, have um, shown that less than 1% of these will acquire bacteria during pregnancy. However, women who have asymptomatic bacteria, and even if you've successfully treated them, a third of them relapse and they should be screened with urine cultures two, four to six week, weeks later. Also, patients who are at higher risk of developing pyelonephritis, like patients with renal impairment or nephropathy, diabetes, sickle cell trait, multiple sclerosis, urinary calculi, or genitourinary anatomic abnormalities, should also be screened with urine cultures Q four to six weeks. Before I discuss management, I just want to let you know that in pregnancy, we have only retrospective data with respect to management of renal disease or case studies. So management varies. And however, we have a lot of good level one evidence in the non-pregnant state. And I will discuss that as it applies in pregnancy. The most common uropathogen in pregnancy is E. coli. And Nitrofurantoin, Bactrim, Ampicillin, Cephalosporins have all been used. Nitrofurantoin in one study was shown to be most cost effective. However, I wanted to keep, make you aware of the recent literature available on the nitrofurantoin use, especially in the first trimester, in the 2009 National Birth Defects Prevention Study. It showed first trimester use of nitrofurantoin resulted in an increased incidence of anophthalmos hypophastic heart syndrome, left heart syndrome, aortic septal defects, and cleft lip and palate. The problem with this study was it was population-based with no causal relationships, and there were multiple comparisons done, you know, which would give you just any positive findings. There are other studies, more than one, actually three studies, showing association of nitrofurantoin use in the first trimester with craniosynostosis. And therefore, we like to avoid use of nitrofurantoin in the first trimester. In the third trimester, it should be avoided in women who are carriers of G6PD deficiency because there, is, um, there may be a possible risk of fetal hemolysis from, from transplacental passage. Trimethoprim is avoided in the first trimester as it is a folic acid antagonist. Quinolones are avoided because it results in arthropathy in infants, and single dose of genomycin 
is avoided in pregnancy for a theoretical small risk of fetal age nerve damage. Management of acute pyelonephritis is usually to hospitalize these patients. Very few can be managed as outpatient. Hydration I wanted to talk about, and it's very important to remember that because all, majority of these patients have contracted volumes, and the fluid we want to use should be normal saline or ringer's lactate. You want to avoid dextrose because that will just increase the, the glycosuria in pregnancy. We want to avoid half normal saline because our purpose is not to cause third spacing, but to restore volume. And of course, prompt management of any respiratory difficulty. The biggest short term of feared maternal risk of acute pyelonephritis is acute respiratory distress syndrome. However, this occurs only in 2% of patients. Other complications are much more common, like hemolytic anemia, bacteremia, thrombocytopenia, or even transient um, reduction in renal function. Frequent contractions occur in patients with acute pyelonephritis, but luckily, usually these occur without any cervical change. The long-term risks are mostly ignored, um, and these are actually quite significant. A third of patients who develop pyelonephritis in pregnancy have urinary tract abnormalities. 40% will develop symptomatic urinary tract infection in the non-pregnant state. And about 40% will develop another episode of infection in a subsequent pregnancy. Fortunately, it is uncom uncommon for these patients to develop end-stage renal disease. The fetal risks associated with acute pyelonephritis is very controversial. Two recent studies, one from Israel and one from Taiwan, have shown a much lower risk of pyelonephritis compared to older studies. And the probable risk for, reason for that is that these newer studies did not include any patients who had no prenatal care. So they excluded these patients with no prenatal care, which have a higher risk of pyelonephritis as they're not being screened for the asymptomatic bacteria. In, in these studies, there was a higher risk of preterm birth rate as well as SGA and low birth weight rate infants. In the older studies, which used four historical controls, there was no increase in perinatal complications. Of course, we'll wait for the new um, prospective randomized trial planned in the Netherlands that will clarify the fetal risks associated with pyelonephritis. Now to change gears, let's talk about chronic kidney disease um, in pregnancy. The KD Kedoki um, first defined this in 2002, and in this definition, they included kidney damage in addition to, to kidney function to define chronic kidney disease. And it should be present for three months or more, and it doesn't matter what the etiology is. The reason kidney damage was included is because the kidney function can, can decrease or continue progressively decrease despite uh, pure initial insults because of secondary factors. So just the existence of kidney damage can result in progressive um, renal dysfunction. And GFR of kidney function is important because most adverse outcomes are related to level of kidney function. This only worsens over time. And Kedoki wanted people with CKD to know their number or their, know their uh, GFR so we can assess adverse outcomes, and they can know that too. So how do we define kidney damage? The usual factors of the pathological markers, the urinary sediment markers, the usual kidney diseases that we know. And this also includes the urinary sediment markers, which could be albuminuria or any cast in the urinary sediment or any imaging markers like polycystic kidney disease, hydronephrosis, or just renal scarring can classify you as having chronic kidney disease. This is the classification, um, the Kedoki classification uh, for chronic kidney disease. Stage one is just presence of kidney damage, but the GFR is normal. And 
in stage two, the kidney damage exists with mild decrease in GFR, and in stage three, there's moderate decrease in GFR. This, the easy way to remember is GF, spaces of 30. So GFR greater than 90, GFR great, less than 90, less than 60, less than 30, and then less than 15. Some people define stage three, which is very critical because that's probably the cutoff where um, loss in renal function takes off. And they've defined it as 3A as less than 60 and 3B as less than 45 mLs per minute. The GFR is calculated based on sedum creatinine, again, preferably in the non-pregnant state. Multiple formulas are used, and I have them here for your reference. The DGO classification modification of this um, staging system after the controversies conference was just published in 2011. And besides the G staging I just discussed, they added the A staging. The A staging includes albuminuria based on the albumin creatinine ratio, and less than 30 is considered normal. Previously, what used to be termed microalbuminuria is, is stage A2, and then, of course, there is a high and nephrotic range of urea. The important thing to remember is that patients who have nephrotic range for urea, even though they have a normal GFR in their G1 stage, they have a relatively very high risk of adverse outcomes. The laboratory evaluation in pregnancy is primarily a 24-hour urine collection. The, the spot protein to creatinine ratio has high false positive and false negative results and so very infrequently used in pregnancy. The Keiduki staging system is very new. So until now, in pregnancy, serum creatinine has been used as a surrogate for renal dysfunction and to establish relationships with pregnancy outcomes and renal prognosis. The degree of preconception renal impairment influences the physiologic adaptation to pregnancy. So in patients with mild renal dysfunction, which was termed as serum creatinine less than 1.4, there is normal intravascular volume expansion and only minimal attenuation of in the increased GFR of pregnancy. With moderate renal dysfunction, the intravascular volume expansion is normal in pregnancy. However, only half the, of these women achieve the expected increase in GFR. In patients with severe renal dysfunction, there is marked attenuation of increased blood volume and no increase in GFR. This correlates with perinatal outcome. So outcomes in pregnancy um, are affected by degree of renal dysfunction, which is indirectly affected by the degree of proteinuria. But a major, major um, parameter is maternal blood pressure, and we'll discuss this more. The fetal outcome is also based, in addition to maternal parameters, on the underlying renal disease. Um, if it's just a primary renal disease, this is not active anymore, compared to a systemic condition which can have continued insults. This is the degree of proteinuria affecting fetal growth is controversial and may just be related to the maternal nutritional status. A recent systematic review published in the Clinical Journal of American Society of Nephrology reviewed 13 studies, and they found in that women with chronic kidney disease compared to women without chronic kidney disease, there is a significant increase in adverse maternal outcomes. Most of these maternal outcomes are the preeclampsia spectrum, which are five-fold increased. Maternal mortality is four times increased. A number of adverse fetal outcomes were increased in patients with chronic disease, but despite that, the life birth rate in these patients is over 90%. When looking at renal complications, so now women with chronic kidney disease were, were compared who were got pregnant versus were compared to women who never got pregnant. And they found a renal, 
linear relationship between the preconception serum creatinine and the likelihood of further renal damage during pregnancy. So patients with mild dysfunction, and these include G staging 1, 2, and 3A of the Kedoki system, a quarter of these patients worsened in pregnancy, and one-fifth of these persisted postpartum. Patients with moderate dysfunction, 40% worsened in pregnancy, and half of these persisted after delivery. 2% actually progressed rapidly to end-stage renal disease, and mostly these patients were who also had over a gram of proteinuria. Patients with severe renal dysfunction defined as serum creatinine of greater than 2, and equivalent to stage 4 and 5 of the Kedoki system, two-thirds worsened in pregnancy and almost all persisted postpartum. And a quarter of these patients progressed to end-stage renal disease within six months postpartum. Absence of hypertension predicts the best outcome. Its presence, however, if patients do have hypertension, we can improve outcomes with optimizing blood pressure control preconceptionally and maintaining good control throughout. Blood pressure management is extremely important in these patients. We can have loose control in patients with other hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. However, if they have chronic kidney disease, very tight control of blood pressure is crucial. Presence of hypertension will increase perinatal mortality six to tenfold. And in one study, Leishra showed that if a patient had a diastolic blood pressure of greater than 100 at conception, 100% of these patients delivered prematurely. Also, women with chronic kidney disease and no hypertension have a 50% risk of preeclampsia. However, if they have chronic disease and hypertension, they have an 80% risk of preeclampsia. Proteinuria, although predictive for the mother's long-term renal outcome, is poorly correlated with immediate obstetric outcome. However, hypoalbuminemia resulting from the proteinuria can result in extensive maternal edema. This is treated with low-sodium diet, bed rest, and intermittent diuretics. We prefer not to use diuretics in pregnancy because they increase the risks of utero-placental hypoperfusion as well as thromboembolism. Nephrotic syndrome increases the risk of arterial and venous thrombosis, including, including renal vein thrombosis, but the efficacy of prophylactic anticoagulation has never been proven in pregnancy or outside of pregnancy, and so use of prophylactic anticoagulation is controversial. I just wanted you to show you the study which was done in men. It's called the Mr. Fit trial, multiple risk factor intervention trial. This was published in 2006, and they followed men with serum creatinine of less than two milligrams per deciliter over 25 years. And they showed that hematocrit was of no prognostic significance. However, patients with decreased GFR, so GFR less than 60 mL per minute, they had a significant increase of, of developing end-stage renal disease over 25 years. They also looked at proteinuria, and they looked at by dipstick, so negative plus 1 or plus 2. And men with protein dipstick of plus 2 or greater had a 36-time increased risk of developing end-stage renal disease over 25 years. This just shows the importance of proteinuria in progression of renal disease. Pregnancy complications, um, of course, worsen with worsening renal dysfunction. As you can see here, this is um, data summarized from multiple case reported studies and retrospective studies, increased risk of IUTR, preterm birth, pre Eclampsia and even perinatal mortality all increase as the kidney function worsens. And loss of renal function also, as I've already shown in previous slides. So now attention has focused on patients with mild renal insufficiency, or what we call serum creatinine of less than 1.4. This is a study published this year from Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Dubai. 
and they included patients with stage one Kidoki staging, stage two, and then this is stage three, four, and five. And you see, even in these early stages, even in patients with minimal uh, renal dysfunction, renal function worsens in pregnancy significantly. So this is stage one, this is stage two Kidoki. And all the pregnancy complications also increase even in these early stages. So their recognition in pregnancy has gained increasing importance. They looked at blood pressure. So patients compared who had systolic blood pressure of 140 or greater compared to patients who had systolic blood pressure less than 40. Look at the difference in worsening of renal function in pregnancy. Significantly increased risk of worsening of, of renal dysfunction with blood pressure greater than 140. Preeclampsia, cesarean delivery rate was significantly twice as much. Preterm birth was twice as much. Low birth weight was four times as much. However, when they looked at proteinuria uh, done on 24-hour urine, there was no significant difference in perinatal outcome. This study is just been e-published this year. This is a study from Italy, and these investigators have developed a dedicated outpatient unit run by MFN ne and nephrologists, and they started this in 2000. They first published their data on 120 patients in 2010. In two years, compared to 10 years, they added 110 patients more and they have just published this study on their 230 patients. They have focused their study on stage one chronic kidney disease or women with normal function but just evidence of kidney damage. The reason they were able to so significantly increase their numbers is as you see, 43% of these patients were newly diagnosed in pregnancy because of the increased awareness created by the KJOP staging system. And as you can see, hypertension prevalence increased with worsening kidney staging system. GFR decreased as we decreased. Proteinuria greater than one gram increased as the, as the renal dysfunction increased. Now here's, uh, in the first column, is controls, and now just look at stage one. Again, stage one, to remind your patients who have normal GFR, they just have evidence of kidney damage. Look at the incidence of preterm delivery. It decreases, the incidence decreases with worsening of renal dysfunction. The gestational age of delivery decreases with worsening dis renal dysfunction. The birth weight decreases, the cesarean section delivery so their infection rate increases. So just stage one, even if you just look at stage one, the complications are so much higher compared to controls or patients who have no evidence of any kidney damage and have normal renal dysfunction. They also looked at proteinuria. This is in the first trimester, and then this is in the last trimester of proteinuria. Proteinuria increased three times in pregnancy in these patients with minimal change in serum creatinine. To summarize their data, after a multivariate logistic regression analysis, hypertension had a significantly increased odd ratio for perinatal complications. Proteinuria greater than one gram also has a significantly increased odd ratio. But when you look at stage one compared to controls, there is also worse outcomes compared to controls. Look at the preterm birth rate, early preterm birth rate, seven times higher in patients, in these patients compared to controls. The point I'm trying to make here is recognition of patients and increased awareness of, of these patients that may come in with no diagnosis of chronic kidney disease also is important to, so we can give, we can manage them more closely. Now let's talk a little bit about management. The management goals are basically, we all want a good fetal outcome, 
with minimal maternal morbidity and mortality, and we want to preserve maternal existing renal function. All these are interrelated because when you preserve maternal renal function, you minimize maternal morbidity and mortality and improve fetal outcomes. So all these are interrelated. So this should be a multidisciplinary management. However, you need a captain of the ship. And in my opinion, this needs to be a maternal fetal medicine person. Pregnancy management is easy for all of you. You know how to do this. You've been doing this a lot. You can establish the stage of renal disease. You can manage hypertension and proteinuria and follow fetal growth. We do recommend frequent prenatal visits in these patients and monitor monitoring of the renal function. Hypertension management, uh, management is critical. Marudi just this year has shown that half of patients just with mild renal dysfunction require polytherapy, and over 90% of patients with serum creatinine greater than 1.4 require polytherapy. Of course, it's recommended that you maximize one drug before you adding the other. Again, urinary screening for urinary infection monthly is very important in these patients. Now, let's talk about renal management of chronic kidney disease, which you, many of you may not be comfortable with, and that includes treatment of reversible causes, preventing or slowing the progression of renal disease, treatment of complications of renal dysfunction, and then identification and adequate preparation of the patient who may require renal replacement therapy. Now, any patient who shows worsening of serum creatinine in pregnancy, we should first look for the reversible causes, like hypovolemia from vomiting or diarrhea. The diagnosis can be difficult because we cannot rely on fractional excretion of sodium. Patients with chronic kidney disease cannot reabsorb the sodium as patients with normal renal function. So in these patients, it's best to give a judicial trial, judicious trial, of fluid repletion and see if that improves serum creatinine and urine output. Of course, we, we want to avoid nephrotoxic drugs and make sure there is no urinary tract obstruction. To discuss preventing or slowing progression of renal disease, we have to just talk about pathophysiology of how progressive renal dysfunction occurs. Now, the initial a disease most likely is inactive or cured in majority of the patients. Only a few patients like lupus will have chronic insults. So in these patients, we want to manage the active disease. However, management of secondary factors, which continue to worsen re renal function, is very important. So let's talk about how these secondary factors Im impact. So in a patient with nephron loss, which could be quantitative, like a patient who's donated a kidney, or qualitative, which could be from nephritis, which results in decreased permeability at the capillary wall, and then compensatory adaptations will occur, or patients with systemic hypertension, or patients who develop afferent arterial or vasoconstriction, like patients with diabetes, or vasodilatation, I'm sorry, that results in transmission of systemic pressures through the glomerular capillus. And this will result in glomerular hypertension and glomerular hypertrophy. Glomerular hypertension will result in glomerular hyperfiltration. The hypertrophy will result in glomerular wall stress. And this will result in detachment and leakiness, which will, um, the leakiness will, will result in cytokine kind stimulation and result of toxic substance into the mesangium, mesangium and result in mesangial expansion. So mesangial expansion, glomerular hypertrophy, and hypertension are the key secondary factors that result in progressive renal disease. To show you diagrammatically, this is a nice glomerulus here, and here is a podocyte, and you can see the, the nice arrangement of the photocyte membranes and the little spaces between for filtration. This again seen here uh, microscopically, nice areas of filtration occurring between the photocyte pores and the glomerular membrane. However, with significant proteinuria, these photocytes flatten, decreasing these pores, 
the porocytes become destructive because of the hypertrophy, and leak, increased leakage occurs. This increased leakage results in mesangial toxicity and, and uh, infiltration, and over time sclerosis, glomerulosclerosis results, and decrease in renal function occurs. Proteinuria itself can result in mesangial toxicity, as well as um, toxic compounds are secreted into the mesangium, which cannot be reabsorbed, like transferrin ion complexes or albumin-bound fatty acids. These result in induction of pro-inflammatory and inflammatory cytokines and tubular interstitial fibrosis. So, to prevent progression of renal disease, we need to control the underlying disease, but also control of secondary factors is very important, which is controlling the blood pressure, as well as controlling the degree of proteinuria. So to control these, control of hypertension is paramount. That is the single most important factor in controlling in preventing progression of renal disease, because controlling hypertension will decrease hyperfiltration, that will decrease proteinuria, and that will decrease mesangial fibrosis. So three of the most important secondary factors can be controlled just by controlling hypertension. This is a study of the African-American study of kidney disease, and I wanted to show you, again done in the non-pregnant state, but this is mean arterial pressure. So lower the mean arterial pressure, slower is the progression of renal disease. So blood pressure control is very important whether you're pregnant or you're non-pregnant. These are the recommendations of the KDECO system in 2011 in the non-pregnant state, but they also probably apply in pregnancy and should be not any different. So in patients with non-proteinuric, whether diabetic or non-diabetic chronic kidney disease. The goal for blood pressure control should be less than 140 over 90. Some people have postulated that in patients with diabetic chronic kidney disease, the blood pressure should be, systolic blood pressure should be maintained between 130 and 135. In patients with proteinuric chronic kidney disease, whether diabetic or non-diabetic, the blood pressure should be maintained at less than 130 over 80. This corresponds to a mean arterial pressure of 96. The uh, blood pressure 140 over 90 corresponds to a mean arterial pressure of 106. So the blood pressure should definitely be maintained between 96 and 106. Now, the systolic blood pressure should not be lower than 120 because data suggests that if you maintain systolic blood pressure lower than 120, there's increase in all-cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality. So these patients need to have very tight blood pressure control between 120 and 130 systolic. Proteinuria is also very important. In patients with non-diabetic chronic kidney disease, the proteinuria preferably should be maintained at less than a gram a day. In patients with diabetic kidney disease, it should be less than half a gram a day. Now, this may be very difficult in patients who have nephrotic range proteinuria. So in those patients, the goal should be a 50 to 60% reduction from baseline and preferably less than 3.5 grams a day. So reduction in both blood pressure and proteinuria is needed to slow progression of renal disease. And we can kill two birds with one stone with smart choice of an antihypertensive drug. So in patients with non-proteinuric chronic kidney disease, you can really choose any antihypertensive. The long-acting calcium channel blockers like amlodipine and nifedipine have been shown to be most effective. Beta blockers, if you want to use, you prefer to use carvedilol or nebivilol. These are the non-selective beta and alpha-1 adrenergic antagonists because they have shown to improve survival in patients with heart disease, as well as they do not affect blood glucose control in women with diabetes. They have also shown to slow the rate of progression to microalbuminuria. 
African Americans, however, do not respond very well to beta blockers. And so in, in them, the first drug of choice probably should be calcium channel blockers. However, in patients with proteinuric chronic kidney disease, the drug of choice should be non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, which are diltiazem or verapamil. These have shown to decrease proteinuria by 30%. In a study published by Bakri, here, the use of non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers compared to the dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. So the dihydropyridine are, are the nifedipine and amlodipine. The non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers are diltiazem or verapamil. And they the, the NCDCAs decrease, NDCAs decrease proteinuria by 30% but the blood pressure control is similar between the two groups of calcium channel blockers. The reason they are different is that the, the NDCAs cause efferent and afferent arterial vasodilatation, and so they don't increase glomerular pressures, whereas the DCAs or the nifedipine type drugs actually preferably increase or dilate the afferent arterial, and so transmit the systolic blood pressure directly to the glomerular capillaries and result in glomerular hypertension and possibly worsening of proteinuria. The NCDAs also decrease glomerular permeability and therefore decrease proteinuria. The tubular reabsorption is blocked by DCAs, whereas not by NDCAs, and therefore proteinuria is also affected. Now, timing of calcium channel blockers is also in, been recently shown to be important. Um, there is a phenomenon called dipping. Most of us, when we're sleeping, we will drop our blood pressure by approximately 15%. Patients with chronic kidney disease have, are known to be non-dippers because they fail to drop this blood pressure at night when they're sleeping. It's been shown that shifting at least one antihypertensive in the evening restores this nocturnal dip. Therefore, bedtime dosing of antihypertensive medication has been shown to reduce cardiovascular risk factors in chronic kidney disease patients. And so in pregnancy also, we should probably be, be spacing one of our antihypertensives at bedtime. Other factors that you can be used to treat um, for renal protection is protein restriction of uh, one gram per kilo in pregnancy. Of course, adding one gram for every urinary loss. Um, and sodium restriction has shown to in enhance the efficacy of some antihypertensive in decreasing proteinuria, particularly NDCIs like mm -hmm. tiltiazem. Smoking cessation should always be advised because that decreases nephrocalcinosis. Now, I'm going to briefly discuss the complications. Increased risk of infections I've already discussed. Worse the, reason, uh, the renal dysfunction, worse the risk of infection. And of course, we should screen them for urinary tract infections and give them prophylactic vaccinations. Anemia is very common, and that usually results in normal cytic, normal chronic anemia. If we don't treat it, these patients will stabilize their hemoglobin around 8. Um, and to, to decrease their risk of transfusions and improve quality of care, it's been recommended that their hemoglobin should be maintained between 10 and 11. We don't want to increase their hemoglobin above 11. And at the FDA recently issued an, an advisory that a hemoglobin level of greater than 11 in these patients increases the risk of serious adverse cardiovascular events without any additional benefit. And so the hemoglobin in these patients should be maintained between 10 and 11. And therapy usually is IV iron. And in some studies, it's been shown that despite normal iron levels, in some patients, IV iron infusions can help improve their hemoglobin. But the mainstay of therapy is erythropoietin stimulating agents like erythropoietin or dopopoietin. When you initiate this therapy, their hemoglobin should be monitored weekly um, to make sure you don't increase their medication, their hemoglobin above 11. If you get a chance to see a patient with chronic kidney disease preconceptionally, 
I would recommend you use it to adjust their medications, optimize their blood pressure control, accurately assess their renal function, educate, and set a management plan for pregnancy. And these patients should get pregnant sooner than later because their renal function will only decline over time. However, they should have good blood pressure control, good blood glucose control. Um, thank you very much. I'm at the end of my talk. In part two in the spring, we will discuss acute kidney disease, dialysis, and transplant patients. I'm open to questions. Great, thanks for a great um, talk and review. Um, while people uh, like to give everybody the opportunity to ask questions at this point, again, there's a couple of ways people can ask questions. Um, feel free to type a question in under the question and answer tab, um, and I will relay that question uh, on. Um, also, if you have a live question, um, unmute your microphone. Select the feedback button in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, um, and then I'll call on you to, and you can ask a question live. I want to thank Dr. Kandewal for another great lecture today and remind everybody um, of the next lecture um, on November 21st, day before Thanksgiving, um, in our research series on databases, new and existing, um, by Ann Lynch. So, again, I'd open it up for any questions um, at this point. Um, so, there's a, a question from um, UNC. Uh, thanks for a great lecture. Is there a level of proteinuria that you recommend prophylaxis for VTE? That's very controversial. Um, and only, of course, I would not prophylax less than 5 grams in 24 hours. After 5 grams um, in pregnancy, you could keep to the prophylactic anticoagulation. Great. Do you, However, there's no good data. You have to remember there's no good data on that. Sure. Sure. Um, do you do you look at AT3 levels in these in these patients for possible AT3 replacement? Um, there is no data on that again. Um, it's again very controversial. There are some people who have looked at that, um, but again, the data is very very iffy. Great. Great. So we have another uh, follow-up question from uh, UCMFM. What is the risk for women who develop severe proteinuria with preeclampsia without previous renal disease to develop renal disease in the future? It's a very good question. There's a lot of uh, data coming out that patients who have preeclampsia subsequently later in life develop chronic kidney disease. Um, again, there's no data, but it is possible that the significant proteinuria results in some kidney damage. And I think it would be prudent in the absence of data for now to we have long-term follow-up data that to follow them in the non-pregnancy state to determine if they still have any evidence of kidney damage, even though the GFR will return to normal. So it may be a good idea. I mean, a lot of these patients continue to have hypertension later in pregnancy um, and, and even later in life. So management of high blood pressure may become important. Great, thanks. Uh, a question from UConn. Do you ever use the protein to creatinine ratio? Uh, yes. You, you know, a lot of our nephrology colleagues love that. And, and uh, there is a recommendation that initially when you do a 24-hour urine collection, at the same time, if you do a protein creatinine ratio, and then you develop a, a ratio between a relationship between what the protein creatinine ratio is and the 24-hour urine proteinuria is. Then you can use this 
in the slides that I we that Bill will actually put up on the website, I have included how you calculate that. So there are about 15 extra slides in in that in in that handout, and one of the slides tells you how you can calculate this relationship, um, and then you can follow a protein to protein ratio subsequent to that. Great, thanks. We'll give one last call for questions. Well, Dr. Kinderwall, thank you again for another great lecture. Um, and we'll hope to see everybody back in a couple weeks. Uh, thanks again for tuning in. And again, like I said, we'll post those um, those um, slide sets on the SMFM webpage. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bill. Thanks. It was great. Thank you.